picture, you're not going to get there. And it's logically right to start there too. But also you have to have policies. Well, some of us are uh, public finance nerds and have lived in public finance all our lives. And 1981, 82, I worked on value-added taxation in India and you know, 25 years later along it came. But the, uh, you've got to get into the detail of targets and regulations. You're going to probably need targets for things like renewables, targets for emissions from cars and trucks, targets on building codes. Some, some part of this is rightly driven by targets. Some part of this is going to be rightly driven by taxing and pricing, and you want to harmonize those things. Um, as you build public finance systems, to build uh, systems based on taxing bad things is no harm, no bad thing at all. It's a very good thing. And there's a lot of revenue available from taxing pollution and taxing congestion. Good revenue in the sense it gives the right incentives as well as raises the revenue. As you build the cities, it's very important to build public finance systems that give cities the chance to take the decisions they need to take. One of the problems in China is that um, a lot of city revenue is raised by selling land. So you've got this slightly strange phenomenon that the footprint of cities in China is going up faster than the population of cities. So density is going down. And that's a problem. And uh, it's going to be a problem with the efficiency of transport and so on, the efficiency of those cities. And it's in part a problem of public finance, because they're selling land to finance the uh, cities. So the public finance system um, is a big part of this story. Uh, it's a no-brainer economically to uh, cut the uh, to cut energy subsidies. It is, you know, one of the craziest things about this world, including about India. Uh, uh, you know, I don't have to tell you about this, but I mean, you've got very big energy subsidies. It makes no economic sense, um, and that's your point. You made that point very clearly. Right, on. and many of us have been making it. I mean, it's not very original. I mean, so many people have been making it for so long. But of course, you want to be the person who puts up energy prices. You want to be the politician that does that. So how you do it is uh, a big part of this story. And Mexico is going out about this quite well, as it's doing it gradually and it's concentrating more in good times and uh, less in not so good times. There, there are roots here, and you have to take the political economy very seriously as well. So this is the way in which the story is, is put together. Now I had the benefit on Saturday morning sitting down with a few friends and listening to some of the story about where uh, India could go on those big issues of um, energy, cities, and uh, agriculture. I'm not going to rehearse it, but I, what I would say that it left me with, because you're going to hear it in these day and a half, but I would say it left me, and this, uh, this is where I'll, I'll conclude, it left me thinking that there's a real chance here. There are big things that India could do that are really attractive and do combine um, growth with climate responsibility, do combine economic development and poverty reduction with mitigation and adaptation. Um, I hope you're going to keep reminding yourself as you run through these examples of this question. Does what we've just heard combine mitigation, reduction in emissions, adaptation, because the climate really is going to change, and economic development and poverty reduction? Now, the system of root intensification intensification or system of rice intensification, I mean, it's more general than rice, but um, is something that does exactly that. It saves water, that's good and energy, of course, associated with moving water, good for development. It actually saves soil. You don't wash your soil into the rivers and ditches. Good for development. Saves on methane emissions, good for mitigation. Makes you more robust against more difficult weather. Good for adaptation. Now that's an example, and it's not a small one. 
many examples in cities too. Mm -hmm. Cities that function better in terms of emissions, cities that are more robust against more difficult weather conditions, and cities that save energy and are good for development. Those are the criteria to, as you get into the detail, keep applying, keep asking that question. Is it good for mitigation? Is it good for adaptation? Is it good for development and poverty reduction? The more we center our actions around those examples, the more persuasive they are and the more persuasive they have the right to be. So I think that should be a constant um, testing, as it were, of the whole discussion. But I'm sorry, I've gone on for a little longer than uh, I intended to, but I get enthusiastic sometimes. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Nick, for that. Uh, I think most engaging and thoughtful and skill, skillful, skillful framing of the of the narrative. I just have to say that I hope we don't have to wait 25 years for this discourse to happen seriously in India. Of course, as you say, uh, policy change takes a long, long time, and it has to be both feasible and attractive, especially for the politicians to to begin to think about the implementation. And decoupling energy from growth, I think, is a serious challenge that not only we, but I think a lot of the world in South Asia especially faces and are particularly vulnerable, as you say. Uh, it'll be a shame to let Nick uh, leave without uh, answering questions that you may have. So although we've kind of beyond uh, our time, we were supposed to finish at 11, maybe we'll take 10 minutes uh, into the tea break and I'll op throw open the floor for questions. Please be short, brief, identify yourself, and Nick will be happy to answer those questions. Have to take advantage of this opportunity. Anybody? No, no questions. You agree with everything that Nick said. <laughs> Thanks, Rajat. Uh, morning, Nick. Uh, my name is Siddharthan. I'm heading the Global Green Growth Institute in India. Uh, Nick, it's good to see you after two years. I think we met in Costa Rica, Cancun sometime last time. Um, the, uh, since I was involved early with the new climate economy design work when I was with WRI before coming back to India, the one issue is really bothered was the, the quantification aspect because when you say economics, uh, it is about numbers, as you said, that simple arithmetic you began with. Um, so the quantification, some of the aspect become very tough, uh, particularly which is linked with the social aspect, uh, particularly in the energy system here, which is complex interplay of multi-sectoral play, agriculture, energy, building, transportation. So the interplay of the energy system across various sectors and the quantification of the economic benefits become a challenge. Um, we are trying to attempt, as you know, you are founding father of a 3GI, you know, that's the core niche of it. My key question here is, how the new climate economy work when we take a cross-cutting issue like energy across sectors, is there any fine, defining principle of quantification uh, of that, which is economically sound and politically attractive? It's just a broader principle, I don't want any specific, any guiding principles how to quantify that kind of cross-cutting issue. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, well, I, I think it'll have to be answered with the big country examples. And uh, we, when we were in Beijing uh, three uh, weeks ago, we were working with our colleagues uh, on, from energy department, essentially at Tsinghua, who were looking exactly at what would it take to peak coal in uh, 10 years? What were the opportunities for extending hydro, extending nuclear? Uh, well, nuclear wouldn't make a huge extra contribution in 10 years, but it could in 20 or 30. So there were quite explicit uh, calculations of the components of energy systems and of the contribution of energy efficiency and how that would come about that could um, not only um, a peak coal within 10 years, but over 30 years or so start to give you the changes that um, are necessary. And some quite explicit expressions of, well, suppose we have 150 one gigawatt nuclear power stations uh, in the next uh, 20 years, and we put it with this amount, this, this 
100 or 200 extra um, gigawatts of uh, hydro and how does it all add up and what does it mean in terms of emissions. My understanding is that there is a similar kind of work going on here in India in exactly the same spirit. So um, crudely, I mean, in each place, uh, some kind of energy system modeling and analysis will be part of the story. Now, you can't, re you can't model the entire energy systems of the world and get really convincing detailed answers in three months. But you can actually build on work that's already taking place and try to say, well, where does that work that's been going on for some time in Tsinghua or in the Planning Commission or here or, or, or wherever, and try to say, where does it leave us? You know, if we say, given where you are now, where do you think those uh, numbers go? That's the way in which we're approaching it. But it is going to build on detail, but it's going to be building on detail that in some way or other is all already there and you're just trying to crystallize. Uh, Lord Stern, I am a former Secretary Environment in the Government of Delhi and now a Joint Secretary in the Ministry of Commerce. I have a conflict on the issue of renewables that you mentioned. In my previous job, I was trying to create more renewables in the city and my present job, I have a conflicting situation on which I need your advice. If the domestic industry files an application for anti-dumping duty imposition on solar equipment, uh, what does one do? Does one protect the domestic industry and create a little problem on the renewable uh, sector, or does one uh, find a different alternative? And what could that alternative be? It's a real problem. I'm struggling with it, and we need to find an answer. Um, I, I start with a, a basic uh, antipathy to anti-dumping uh, from the point of view of um, trying to think about uh, the benefits of lower costs uh, around the world, particularly for um, the kinds of products we're talking about. And I guess I have the basic economist reaction is to um, free trade in that sense. And you know, I think if somebody's offering to sell you something very cheaply, you should buy it and send them a thank you letter. Uh, <laughs> now, I appreciate that's not the whole answer because this is a story of new industries. Um, a lot of the anti-dumping stuff comes up in protecting old industries that probably shouldn't be protected. Yeah? Uh, that are on the way out and should be on the way out, unless they change dramatically, and they could change dramatically if they had the appropriate competition. This isn't quite that. So the first reaction is not the whole story, which your question recognized very well. But I do think you should bring the skeptical lens to that and say, well, uh, if we had good competition, um, would these guys do better and could they, could they do better? But I think in this case, the infant industry argument may not be empty. So you're going to have to bring the um, wisdom and judgment of your IAS training to the uh, table. But I would start where I started. Um, with not really wanting to rush to anti-dumping stuff, um, but asking yourself the question, if we want to bring on these industries, and I think India could do very well in, in some of these, how best uh, do we do it? And starting trade wars, particularly in green areas, I, I, I would worry. I think the audience is beginning to warm up. Yeah, yeah. my name is Ashok Vishandas. I am from Commission on Agriculture Cost and Prices. Of late, there has been a tendency at the national level and national government, uh, the urge and ambition to go nuclear, 
the nuclear power which have as of now and those who are the emerging countries and having the desire and ambition to become nuclear and this has a climatic overheads obviously and how because exteriorly they say and advocate yes they are for the for the climatic uh, protection but deep inside their uh, national ambitions they want to go nuclear so so one is that there is a there is a conflict of interest within the nations on one hand they they want to establish themselves as a nuclear power at the global level but inside it has a uh, some kind of climatic overhead so how how you propose and advocate to balance the two conflicting interests um i think nuclear power probably does have a, an important role to play in um, going to the low carbon economy. Uh, the politics of nuclear power are different in different countries. But as, as one can fairly confidently predict that Germany will have um, not much nuclear power going forward and that France will probably have quite a lot and it depends on the politics in those nations. But I think the difficulty in decarbonizing is sufficiently great that we should be looking at all forms of uh, non-fossil fuel power. And I would include uh, nuclear in that. I think the big expansion in nuclear, as I said already, is going to be in China. And I think in the next 15 years, we will see for the first time something like scale economies in nuclear. But the nature of the beast is we've never really seen them before. And we may see them over these next 15 or 20 years. And that's exactly the kind of learning that should be shared. I hope there'll be ma massive breakthroughs in energy storage. And that could transform the role of renewables. And I think one of